Welcome home, brave heroes. I'm Ash. This is Ash Quest, and I am very proud to welcome Bob Freeman, the designer of the Fire and Ice Miniatures Adventure Game. Bob, take it away. Who are you? What do you do? Well, and thank, thank you so much, by the way, for being on the channel. Thank you for having us. Uh, we're Border and Games. I'm Bob Freeman. I'm I'm, I'm Connor Freeman. We've been uh, designing games for a few years now, and and the reason we're here is because we have a Kickstarter going right now where we're working on the IP Fire and Ice for Frazetta Girls, Boxy Productions, and Dynamite Comics. Yeah, we're right in the, in the middle of the campaign, and uh, we're really excited about it. And we knew that you were excited about it, so we wanted to be here to uh, kind of uh, share in that excitement with you. Yeah, I, I actually had to rewatch the movie just so I could make sure that I was fresh up on the lore. And weird, weirdly enough, that most of the movie, about 75% of the movie, I'm like, I don't remember this. Yeah. I must have, I must be watching it through a completely different lens now than I was the last time I saw it, which it's been about seven years, but okay. uh, it, it was it was more amazing than I remembered. So I, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I definitely think it's the sort of movie that gets better uh, the more times you watch it. It was that definitely does. better. Definitely better this time than it was the first time that I that I remember. I, I guess there were th some things I wasn't able to appreciate about it then. Couldn't, didn't have the the perspective, and now I can. Now I'm like, this is this is actually pretty great. I I did a little bit of digging. You don't have to do a lot of digging, but to to find a cult detective out there saying a couple of things one of the things that i i saw was that you've been working on this game for four or five years how long have you been working on this game i think it was um 2019 might have been might have been late 2018 uh and it's interesting the way that came about uh ralph Bashi, uh his twitter account had posted a picture from the movie and I commented about how much I loved it. I saw it in the theater in 1983 when I was 17. And I went back, I saw it like four times in the theater. <laughs> Just loved it. I was a huge Frazetta fan. But I commented about how much I loved the movie. And why haven't you guys made an RPG about this, you know, from this world yet? And Sarah Frazetta, the granddaughter of Frank, uh, she sent me a message and she said, uh, hey, that's a great idea. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> and I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> and so we started chatting and uh, we struck up a, a friendship and we've been working really closely with, with Frazetta Girls, well, since, since then, I guess since late 2018. So, And then the pandemic happened right. and that kind of slowed everything down, right? We weren't able to play test the way we wanted. And no. Just got kind of muddy, but uh, we brought in Dynamite as partners, and uh, yeah, so we've got the game out there now. Awesome, and that that's that's a success story in and of itself. Just to just to get through pandemic years and still be on that project that you started before it, right? Uh, yeah, we, so yeah. yeah, that that was a good question that she asked too. Why why hasn't this been done already? Or the, a, a great question that came. Because it's been, I don't want to make anybody feel old here. It, it's been, if it came out in 1983, that's that's 40 years of opportunity that we've had to make a game. Yeah, yeah, yeah it certainly is. And a large part of that is, is uh, Frank got older and Frank got sick. You know, then once he passed, then, you know, there were a lot of children. And so they're separating this and that. And so, they, you know, everything was in turmoil. Fire and Ice just kind of slipped through the cracks a little bit. And... She had, Sarah had been hungry to do something with it because she loved Tigra, she loved Dark Wolf, and uh, she just hadn't had, she didn't know what vehicle to use, and when I made that suggestion about an RPG, she thought, oh, that, that, that would be perfect, and uh, she's been a terrific partner in this. Yeah, that, that is pretty perfect. Why, why fire and ice? You had the idea to make an RPG. Surely you had, you have had perhaps over the years several ideas to attribute to different things. What, why land on fire and ice of all things? Well, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've pitched a lot of games to a lot of people, right? So in a different, a lot of different genres. But I've always had a passion for Frazetta and a passion for that movie. And with 
when the opportunity came, you know, I, we just we jumped at it. Yeah, it was really helpful that they were very personable, very reasonable, and like not not like in, 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 they 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 were real people talk, talking to us in a way that you didn't get with other with other like big IPs or whatever. Right. It, it, so, was, it was actually we were able to, to talk to them and actually, you know, form a friendship. That's right. Other properties that we had pitched, like w one of the things that we had tried to do was to develop uh, a, a role-playing board game around The Devil Rides Out, which was this, this great hammer film that came out in the late 60s starring Christopher Lee. And so we, we spoke with the Dennis Wheatley estate, and they immediately got lawyers involved, and they're talking money, and they want money from us, to lie, you know. And it's like, well, no, we, we're looking for a partnership. And so that's why when the Frazettas came along, they immediately sensed that, um, the, the, you know, that we wanted a partnership. And so it, it just fell in right. beautifully. We just we're, We were just totally in sync. I get the sense that they were more kind of in touch with with the idea and not just it, not the same as talking to people in suits basically exactly right. right like like it, connor said they're real people you know and they have their own passions and own interests right. and are we just we just came together it, it's much more refreshing talking to people who actually care about what they're what they're dealing with right talking to sarah who obviously she 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 has Presetta's name right she has that He's the granddaughter of Frank, and so she actually cares about what's what's going on, which is much better than some lawyers who got past an IP thirty years right. ago who don't actually and have just, any relation. To yeah, and they're just looking to capitalize on it. Right? Yeah. Our beloved game industry is rife with the with the type, and you just got to know who to look out for and kind of who 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 will who will go forward with you and not not try to trample on your idea or or take you for granted. So, yes. Fire and Ice, you, you saw the movie four times in theaters uh, when it came out, uh, you, probably many other times since then. You've been w w analyzing scenes. What, what went through your head when you thought about gamifying the experience of Fire and Ice? What was your approach to that? You know, initially, you know, we've been, we've been playing role playing games. Well, I've been playing since '78. He's been playing since he was born, practically. So, uh, so, so we had general ideas going into it, but we both sat down. And we said, "All right, let's just watch the movie again, yeah. right? And let's just watch it." And so, what we did was with this game, and, and it's why it's two games in one. There's a skirmish game aspect to it, and there's a role playing game aspect to it. Right. And it's because we wanted to duplicate everything that was in the film. So when you play this game, whether you're playing it in RPG mode or skirmish mode, everything the characters can do on screen, you're doing in the game. So the the, the, uh, right. the character cards, yeah, implement every every motivation, right. every ability, everything is, is reproduced. Right, we really did. We sat down and thought through every fight scene, how many hit points a character is going to have in order to match up with how many hits they take in, in this specific yeah, fight or whatever. Yeah, we were, we're like, we were, okay, if this deals a critical hit, then he's able to do so much damage and be able to win at, at, at this certain point in the fight. Yeah. And we're able, and we, we sat down and we really thought that stuff through and, you know, how many attacks a person can make and how many little tricks they can do to... to yeah, and the fact that sometimes they could do something and later they couldn't. So that made it made sense to us where, okay, you can do this, you know, per turn or this per advance. And that's uh, that's kind of the way we break it down, right, in, in turns and advances. And an advance is whenever uh, Necron pushes the ice, right? Right. right. When the glacier moves. And so you there's a time frame. Yeah. So that, that glacier keeps moving, and there and there's a bunch of game modes in the in the yeah, in the it, game itself it's involving that where the board actually moves, yeah. right? And you're so you're sliding the board, the ice is pushing it, uh, yeah. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. So the, there's just so many elements to it. This is this is definitely where I want to 
take a quick opportunity to tell viewers if if you haven't been sold on this yet and if you've seen the Kickstarter page before, there are updates to it now. There are a lot of videos pertaining to these different game modes that Bob's talking about. I would absolutely go and watch those and see the kind of stuff that we're excited about talking about here because it it's awesome that you guys have all of this this joy, this excitement just when you're talking about the game modes that sometimes that's that's completely missing from folks who are developing games. They're looking at numbers and everything feels so sterile. They're like, well, you can roll the dice and then here's your numbers that you can uh, attack, defense. Uh, we'll, we'll do a, a movement amount. There, there are games and IPs that I love that are sterile, tragically, because they don't have that, that spirit behind it. I don't, I don't think it's like hard to see or hard to miss. Well, that's part of what went into the design of this. Like, so originally, we, we, it was very complicated and very bogged down. We started stripping all that stuff out because what what we realized was is like we grew up with Dungeons and Dragons, right? And original Dungeons and Dragons was built by math nerds, right? Love math nerds, but it was a very that's that's kind of what you're doing. You're crunching numbers, you know, and then. What we thought was, was, well, Frank and Ralph, um, they create from emotion, right? And so we needed to strip the numbers out and get to the emotion of the game and try to build that kind of spirit around it. And I, I think that really made this, the game sing once we did that. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And you decided on a skirmish format, which I thought was pretty interesting because so far... So far, I say this tentatively, I, I, I hope I can stay on this path, I really do, but so far I've been able to stay away from actually playing or getting any interest in, in beginning the rabbit hole that is Warhammer, uh, 40k, yeah. fantasy battles, any of it. But yeah. that doesn't mean that I won't play other skirmish games. Are, are you a war gamer? We don't play a lot of skirmish games. We, we fell in love with The Song of Ice and Fire. You know, the George R. R. Martin property. Right, and there's that miniatures adventure game, or the, the miniatures game that they came out with very recently, a skirmish game where you're moving the armies around. Yeah. That, that, we sort of fell in love with that. And that's what jump-started me on the skirmish game kick. There, there have been a few others very recently that yeah. that that we've played with. And, and, and other games that had elements, you know, like uh, you know, Solomon Kane kind of has elements to that, the, the board game, and uh, uh, Anno Domini. Right, um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, but we just wanted, in, in watching the movie, we wanted to simulate that combat, so we kind of built the RPG with this skirmish game element. Yeah, so, because we, it's a very battle-intensive and so uh, we thought it'd be much better than the typical, you know, Dungeons and Dragons round uh, turn situation. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If you don't love skirmish games. You, I think you'll dig this one, right? Because it, <sighs> it's very, it's rules light. It's very immersive. Rules light's awesome. Uh, it, it, there's there's times that it. it should work out great. There's other things like I imagine I haven't played a song of ice and fire. I imagine that's not rules light, but I would actually not want it to be. I would want a song of ice and fire to be complex. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a lot of moving pieces. Yes. Yes. And th that is the mistake we made in the beginning is, is, is taking the, the more traditional skirmish games and war games and putting too much of that into fire and ice. Yeah. It was, it was it was the br the brilliant idea we had to strip a great deal of it back, make it a little bit more chaotic, a little bit more uh, more fast and and yeah, uh, definitely fast paced. Visceral it should be yeah uh, yeah. Yeah, events events move quickly in the movie, so yeah, and everybody's under the constant threat of just Necron deciding to have a tantrum and the glaciers coming forward yet again. I think. I think my question may have already been answered. The next one I'm going to ask already been answered in in a sense. But uh, the game modes, the multiple game modes that you guys have now, do they do they do they have their origins in that time period where you were beginning to conceive this game, or or 
did they actually kind of branch out from the end of your development of the skirmish rule set? Probably in the in the middle, right? So the the first game mode, the fire and ice game mode, was there from the beginning, right? Whereas we knew we wanted the ice to move, right? We were removing the glacier and yeah. slowly the game board's getting smaller and more chaotic, and yeah, and so yeah, right, and yeah, yeah so it makes that, it very claustrophobic. Right. That was that was that was there from the beginning, pretty much. We knew that that game mode was going to be there. The rest slowly developed. Yeah. As we, As you know, you wanted, you wanted the, the one-on-one, the King of the Mountain, which is a lot of fun. Right. Where You're controlling the, a center game board and trying to keep enemies off of it and uh, various others, were, which we just wanted to afford you different options, right? Yeah. We wanted, and sort of to recreate different sections of the movie. Right, where, like uh, hide and seek, right. where, you know, where Tigra is captured and Escapes. And escaped and captured. And escaped. So we wanted to simulate that. Right. So for people that love that part of the movie. And we added a solo mode because of the backers. Yeah, uh, we actually. didn't put a solo mode in at all. And, and I've never liked solo modes. Oh, but man. We, yeah, so people were, were asking for one. And we sat down one night and we said, well, okay, can we do this? Yeah. And then we just... We hammered it out and said, "Oh wow, this is this is actually pretty fun." Yeah, it, yeah so, this works. Yeah, that that's great. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, we pulled it right out of the movie, right? So we're we're sitting there thinking, "Oh, how do you do solo?" And then it, it dawned on us, okay, at one point, Dark Wolf's in the thick fog, and these these subhumans are just coming out of the fog like out of nowhere, and he's sitting there and attacking them as they show up, and so. Our solo mode simulates that. You randomly scatter these subhumans, and then they just, uh, you, you roll a die, and they appear at random places and and come and attack you. So, it's yeah, it's it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I was really surprised. Yeah. And it's, we just had to find that connection to the, movie to the movie to make that work. So, yeah. That sounds amazing. I'm a, I'm a solo, ga- solo gamer myself. I do have a, a party a table, as I call them, that I game with about once every two weeks to a month, depending on our work schedules and if we can make everything line up. But that work schedule thing, that that real life adulting thing really makes it hard sometimes. And sometimes you just you don't want to skip game night. So that and it, it can be a lot of fun just for the same reason that I might pull out a deck of poker cards and play solitaire. So I'm, I'm going to be enjoying the solo game mode myself. Yeah, I but, think I think th- I think people will appreciate this. Yes, right. Yeah. I uh, will also uh, say if if you hadn't, they homebrewers were going to do it for you regardless. Somebody was going to ask, <laughs> "How can we play this solo?" Somebody was going to come up with rule sets. Yeah. Yes. You might you uh, might as well do it. Have it official. Yeah. We'll cover right. it now. Yeah. Have you gotten to work with anybody involved with the original production of the Fire and Ice film? I know you've met family members, but... Yeah, so I really, uh, you know, when we first did this, my first thought was, I need to reach out to Steve Sandor, the guy who played Dark Wolf, because I I just loved him as an actor so much in that. Sadly, he had just passed away, so I didn't get that opportunity. But the only people that were involved in the production that we've actually spoken with are uh, Roy Thomas and Jerry Conway, who wrote the screenplay. Um, I reached out to them early and, and discussed the movie with them, and uh, and they were they were they were both very very kind and generous, and uh, yeah, terrific. I, and I'm just such a big fan of them, so getting to getting to speak with them even briefly was a thrill for me. Right? Yeah. I uh, I think that's nothing to sneeze at. When I when I saw their names in the credits, I'm like, hey, that's not Frazetta or Bakshi. That's those are different names. I. Those yeah. people are important. I feel like, I feel like they might yeah. be easy to gloss over, but they, you shouldn't gloss over them. No, not at all. Not at all. They're very integral. I mean, they, they wrote the they wrote the story, right? So they took Frank's images, right, and they and they tied it up in 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 a nice little bow and just made it made a really nice sword and sorcery story out of it. And uh, yeah, so yeah, their their contributions can't be you know glossed over at all. They're, they're fantastic. So one thing I, I wanted to know, as as I watched the movie, 
and I watch these different characters, and I'm, I'm thinking about the different characters that are featured in the board game, I see the subhuman priestess, and she's awesome. Her design is awesome. She's dancing around. She's enraged. She's mocking the heroes who are coming up on Necron's domain, and she's there stealing the scene for all of 15 seconds, and then she's gone, right. and we never see her again. Uh, <laughs> how did you come to decide who you should feature in the game? How, how did you decide to give her a role, uh, to give anybody a role? She is Frank's daughter, yes. the actress that Tolly Frazetta. So, and she is the she's the person who started Frazetta Girl. So that's Sarah's mother, right? right? So when we're when we're doing this, it was like, well, we've got Holly right here. You know, we we've got to yeah. showcase her because she's fantastic in the movie and <laughs> yeah. and uh, all those. Yeah. yeah. So we I wanted to make sure we honored her for for that, and uh, it just seemed to. Yeah. obvious to be an exclusive figure and and now not so exclusive we decided just to keep it in the campaign and, and give it to everybody who backs so. yeah and, and she look oh she looks great yeah uh, on on screen as well oh um, yeah and she has some you know i don't know if you've seen her character card but she has some awesome abilities yeah. she's raising people from the dead what yeah, or yeah. Like healing and yeah. doing, uh, we we decided to include like blood magic type uh, uh, type stuff to which sort of fits with the kind of evil priestess uh, archetype. Yeah. Re and really, we were just making a push to include as many characters as we can from the from the movie. Yeah. Right. I personally have been a very big proponent of get as many subhumans, subhuman characters as possible. Right off the bat, I was obsessed with like putting the envoys in, the, the purple robed uh, mm -hmm. uh, characters and uh, that the, those sorts of uh, of, of sub villainous subhuman characters. And look, we're going to keep this game going, right? So we're, we're going to support it, you know, long after this campaign's over. There's characters that we've not released yet that are going to be released. Uh, very, like, you know, like Quartermain, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the pirate captain yeah. you know, who takes Taro to Ice Peak. And, right. uh, he, he was on for like a whole five seconds, but he's, again, another I know. Really character. I, I uh, saw him and I'm like, there he is. There's the guy with the, with the arm. Um, right. Watch yeah, him carefully. Like, Gone. Yes, but that's great. That's great. They get to have, uh, they all get to have their own kind of spotlight, their own new context, their own, their own goals, their own. People get to vicariously just create stories for them the same way. That stories exactly. were created that's from why, the artwork. That's why it's an RPG. Yeah, yes. you can tell the story. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. This one might be a bit obvious, but like, how did you decide the order of appearance for the stretch goal characters, uh, for those who we have seen, as well as for the people in the silhouettes who we have? I'm sure nobody out there can look at the silhouette and have any idea who it could possibly be. But right. Right. you'll. Uh, it shifted as the campaign went, right? But originally, and it was Connor's idea for this, was initially it was a Fire Peak expansion followed by an Ice Peak expansion. So originally what we had was was Taro, the Envoys, and King Jarl, and the Fire Keep map, right? That was, that was what we were pushing first. The idea that, for reenacting the scene from the movie when the Envoys attacked Taro and them yeah. and the, at the very beginning. Right, and then after that, we were going to have the Ice Peak map followed by four subhumans, uh, Queen Juliana, and uh, of course Necron himself. But then, you know, of course, the fans they were like, "Why, why aren't we getting Necron now?" So we we're like, "Oh, okay, all right, we we get it. We had a we had a, a plan, but uh, we shifted yeah. the plan, right? Yeah, and probably better for it. You know, yeah. we wanted him in your hands, so we put him in your hands." I mean, it's always good. You need to test the waters. You need to adapt, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that, I, I, I think we we're making the right choice, really. Um, and the the new maps as they come out, the Fire Keep map, the Ice Peak map. Once we get to it, um, those open up new game modes. Um, the characters. Each time a character is introduced into the game, it adds rules, right? Because every pretty character much. is unique. 
and they have special abilities, and those abilities then become, you know, a part of the rule set. So the rule book will expand as new new players come into the game. It's kind of a living right, so, rule book. Yes, exactly. So as we as we create new scenarios in the future, there'll be a rata, you know, to to you know keep keep this thing. It's a living, breathing world. All right. So yes. you guys heard that there's going to be support for the game, or at least that's the intent after the campaign. Uh, Connor's awesome. He's a genius. We we got to recognize that right now. Um, okay. Awesome ideas there. Glad glad we could get more people in there, as many people as possible. I like the envoys a lot, actually. I'm I'm probably going to spend points on playing some envoys in my games. So uh, really cool to see their inclusion. I hope we get to find out who those mysterious silhouettes are. So, like, I hope you guys really think about if you're on the fence going and backing the board game at the board game tier at the very least. Uh, and I guess I just wanted to ask one more question because of my own curiosity. Uh, boxers? Yeah, there are. Yes. Yeah, they're. Yeah, they're. They are in there. I think. Yep. I just remembered that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. I mean. Right. I mean, they're very fond. Our, our partners, right? They're very fond of merch, right? And, and any any merch we can get. <laughs> We're a group on a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, peril. Right. So yeah, so yeah, they did. They designed fire and ice boxers. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. So we owe this one to the Frazetta girls. Yes. Yeah. The, she, they are a genius at uh, developing t-shirts, right. shorts. Merchandising. Yes. They have, and they, they have, you know, you should go to, definitely you should go to their website. They have a beautiful array of, of high-end posters, uh, coasters. Just if you if you can put Frank's art on it, they're doing it, and it's beautiful stuff. That's a fair uh, point. That's a fair point. Just can't, you can't have enough Frazetta stuff, right? Okay. you got a den full of it. So, uh, yeah posters and everything covering every inch so that and and i'm i think a lot of the the novels i have have um frazetta art on them as well yeah that's how i discovered frank was through conan novels yep um i read a lot of conan a lot of uh of uh, tarzan and so he was doing all the all the paperback covers for those and yeah obsessed from childhood so. it's easy to see why it's iconic it is seminal, and we don't see it anymore. We see the same things, which is great. That's fine, but like we don't see more of it. We don't. We don't see a lot of inspired by. I guess Boris. Right. Uh, Boris Vallejo is this, the closest. A lot of fantasy art you see, you, you can tell they were inspired by Frazetta, but what a lot of it lacks is that just that visceral, raw energy that he he was able to generate. He was just a master of that, and he was he was an impressive individual. Like he was, he was, he was a consummate athlete as well as an artist. And uh, it's a, the funny story I like to tell about the film. So it was done in rotoscope, right? So they have actors performing all this stuff. So they got all these stuntmen there, and they're saying, "Okay, we want we want you guys to do this." And the stuntmen are like, whoa, 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 we can't do that. There's no way. We break a leg or whatever. And Frank, who's in his mid-50s at the time, he says, no, nah, no. Nah. And he goes out there, and he's running around, jumping, rolling, and springing up. And they're, like, amazed at just what a, what a physical specimen this guy is. So, uh, yeah, Frank was Frank was just amazing. And, uh, yeah, we're, the world is a, a sorry or place without him in it. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I, I guess he thought he, he didn't have any right drawing barbarians if he didn't also have the strength and agility of a barbarian. Look at the face of all those people. He's painting himself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You look, look at Conan and look really close at that face. That's a self-portrait. You know, he just put long hair on him. You know, so yeah. <laughs> I'm going to look into it. I'm looking into it. Uh, guys, that's about all I had. Is there any closing words or additional statements or any plea call to action you'd like to make to the viewers on the channel well first of all i'd like to thank you for having us on and thank you for you know all the videos you've done about it so far um we 
we appreciate every backer that we got, but the more backers that come in, the more stuff that gets unlocked, and that's that's better for everybody. So s- spread the word, and uh, we'll keep we'll keep making a great game. Try right, yeah. guarantee it. And we're and we're here. You're up. we're easy to find. Yeah. You got a question? We're answering it. So there you go. There you go. Humans, humans behind the screen, guys. That's what we like to see, right? We want to we want to reward this behavior. We want to reward the communication with the fans. We want to reward the listening to the fans. We don't get that all the time with everybody. I know we we see it a lot with Avalon Hill, and we really really appreciate that. We have to make sure that we reward this sort of thing. So people in suits who aren't in touch with stuff see the kind of feedback loop that's going on, and they say, okay. Whenever the people that we give money to want to do this, we let them. We don't get in the way. Uh, best case scenario, anyway. Guys, thank you very much. And uh, take care. And we'll, we'll maybe see you again later. Yeah. Thanks, thought. Thanks. Thank you so much for watching. Please comment anything you'd like down below, including if you'd like to ask anything about the Fire and Ice board game. I'm sure the creators are more than happy to peruse the comments and check them out and see if there's anything that they are at liberty to answer. Guys, thanks again. I will see you in the next one. Have a great rest of your day. And now onward, brave heroes.